Good morning. We are glad that you can join us on this second Sunday of Lent. It's March 13th. And we are glad that you are with us in our second Sunday of also in our Proverbs series. We continue to lift up our world in prayer. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs> Join me for our call to worship. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Let us seek God's will in all we do, and God will show us the paths to take. Everyone who finds wisdom is joyful. Happy are those who gain understanding. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold her tightly. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Your people have gathered here in your holy sanctuary, O Lord. We gather to sing your praise, hear your word, and respond with our very lives. We live in difficult times. We need your wisdom. We need your strength. We need your redemption. We need your Holy Spirit to work among us today. Amen. Now, will you join me in uh, singing the great hymn, How Firm a Foundation, number 529. <laughs> Say our prayer of confession. 
confession together. Gracious and loving God, we turn to you seeking your mercy. You call us to focus on you, but we focus on ourselves instead. You call us to be humble, but we gloat in our pride. You call us to abandon ourselves, but we cling to our achievements. You invite us to decrease as you increase and to disappear as you become more visible. Forgive us for our boasting and bragging. Help us to pull focus from ourselves and to remember that our true worth comes from you and you alone. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Those who listen to the words of wisdom will be secure and live in ease. Know that our God never ceases to reach out in love and forgiveness, guiding us on the path of life and righteousness, calling us to claim our true identity as disciples and beloved sons and daughters of the living God. Amen. Last week, we started a new series on wisdom literature as specifically found in the book of Proverbs. And we talked about wisdom as being the combination of experience and knowledge and discernment and putting those together to come up with wise choices or solutions. We talked about the job of the sage because the book of Proverbs is indeed a book of anthologies put together by our sages. We looked at the job description of a sage and how a sage's job was to ensure shalom for the community, was to manage fools within the community, and to build character for the leadership in the community. We talked about that Proverbs was put together for a very specific reason. It was put together to instruct young men in court. And finally, last week, we ask you to think about who has been a sage in your own life and in this congregation. If you look at the bulletin, and you can find that in the Friday update or on our web page, you will see a list of the anthologies within the book of Proverbs. You'll see that the first nine verses, which we preached from yesterday, we'll be doing today and next week, are uh, give us a wisdom worldview. And that worldview is from the perspective of a parent-child relationship. And you will see language within that anthology of son or child or mother or father. The second anthology is the first collections of sayings from King Solomon's period. The third anthology is Proverbs 22 through 24, and it's sayings of the wise. Then the fifth and uh, the fourth anthology, sorry, is the second book of sayings from the period of Solomon. The fifth anthology is the words of Agur and its curses and numerical sayings, and that is chapter 30, and then. Chapter 31 is the hymn to a valiant woman, which is very well known. But today, we're not looking at the job description, but what the key message was for the sage. And so we're starting with the third chapter, beginning with verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, but don't rely on your own intelligence. Know Him in all your paths, and He will keep you your way straight. Don't consider yourself wise. 
Fear the Lord and run away from evil. Then your body will be healthy and your bones strengthen. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will burst with wine. Don't reject the instruction of the Lord, my son. Don't despise his correction. The Lord loves those he corrects like a father who treats his son with favor. Happy are those who find wisdom and those who gain understanding. Her profit is better than silver and her gain better than gold. Her value exceeds pearls. All you desire can't be compared to her. And her right hand is a long life and her left are wealth and honor. Her ways are pleasant. Her paths are peaceful. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who hold her tight are happy. The Lord laid the foundations of the earth with wisdom, establishing the heavens with understanding. With his knowledge, the watery depths burst open and the skies drop dew. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May your scripture always be my delight, O Lord. May I not be deceived in them or deceived by them. Amen. So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of us have trouble asking for directions? I remember growing up, Sometimes my dad would make the wrong turn and he would be hesitant to stop and ask for directions. I remember on many occasions of putting things together, getting a box and it's required assembly and we don't open the instruction box and we think we have it figured out only to discover we've missed a step and have to go back and start all over. The failure to ask directions means that we think we know more than we actually do. So today I want us to look at a few things we may or may not know. NASA has a page that's called uh, Vital Signs of the Planet and it lists things and some of them I knew, and some of them I didn't. Did you know that the earth is not flat? Well, yes, we do know that. Did you know it's not completely round either? The earth has a bulge around its waistline, the equator. And that bulge is so small that from space we can't see it from the naked eye so it looks completely round. Did you know that days are growing shorter? 4.6 billion years ago, one day on the earth was six hours. That's how long it took. But now it's 24 hours. 50 million years ago, it was... 21.9 hours and a few billion years from now it will be much longer. Our earth is slowed down by the tides of the, caused by the moon 1.7 milliseconds every 100 years. I didn't know that. Did you? I did know that there wasn't always several continents. They were together and split apart more than once. I didn't know that. Scientists believe that the Earth was completely frozen on at least two occasions. The driest place on Earth is a desert in South America, next the Pacific Ocean. That desert is in the country of Chile. 
it's estimated that that desert did not receive a single drop of rainfall for 400 years until 1972 when there was a sudden storm. On average, that desert receives 0.03 inches of rainfall every year. Did you know Earth's gravity is not uniform? Did you know that sea levels change? Our sea level was once higher than it is now, and it is rising. Did you know our sun has a huge appetite? It burns up so much hydrogen that scientists believe in 50 billion years it will probably burn itself out. Did you know that the moon is not our only companion? There are two asteroids that look as if they're following the Earth when really they're in the pattern of the sun. And last, there really is a calm before the storm. Let me read this last scripture passage, 19 and 20. The Lord had laid the foundations of the earth with wisdom, establishing the heavens with understanding. In other words, all the things that I just read, God knew. I may not have known them, but God knows them. With God's knowledge, the watery depths burst open and the skies drop dew. So the first message of the sage is to tell us that there is an order to creation. It's not chaos. There is a definitive order even though we may not know or understand it all. God took chaos and made order. And it is complex. Francis Collins, uh, in his book, Language of God, which I've mentioned before, talks about in that book the team he led to discover the human genome. That was several years ago. And here's what he says in his book. The human genome consists of all the DNA in our species, the hereditary code of life. This newly revealed text was three billion letters long. And it was made up, it was written with a strange, and cryptographic four-letter code. Such is its amazing complexity in the information carried in a single cell of the human body that a live reading of that code at a rate of one letter per second would take 31 years even if reading continually day and night. Creation, my friends, has an order that is beyond our capacity to completely grip, to completely analyze, or to even imagine. That is the first message of the sage. The second message reminds us of the first. God is sovereign over human efforts to order our experience. In other words, God created an order and our ability to completely understand that order and our ability to even understand our own experiences is limited, but it's not limited to God. We are limited by our experience. We are limited by our knowledge. We are limited by our discernment. And hence, we are limited in our wisdom. 
There is an order of creation and we are limited. So what is the sage trying to do with this message? Well, first, the sage is targeting the young and impulsive with that message. For all of you that act before you think, you need to remember there is an order and you don't know it all. When you read the first nine chapters, the sage is speaking through a parental voice, trying to cool the heels of the impulsive youth, but also to remind those of us who never outgrew our impulsiveness that there are consequences for making the wrong decisions and there are consequences for not paying attention to wisdom. But here's the beauty of the wisdom literature. While that is the target of Proverbs, the other books, which are Job, Ecclesiastes, and the ultimate wise one, Jesus, they're trying to send the rest of us that same message. They're targeting those of us who have become set in our ways. The frozen chosen are those that are locked in and frozen in our faith. The wisdom literature and the wisdom sayings of Jesus are set to remind us that we don't know as much as we think we do. There are consequences for impulsive behaviors, but there are also consequences for those who lack curiosity, for those who think they know it all and will not ask for directions. Ministry in the 21st century should be asking the question, what is God trying to teach me? What is God trying to get me to pay attention to? What does God need me to learn? We should see a gap between what we expect by our own limited knowledge and what actually happens. And in that gap between, we don't need to blame somebody or point fingers. We need to ask questions. What do we need to learn? What would God have us to do? We have great examples here right in our own church and our food ministries. Let me explain. Our food pantry is 30 years old. Sue's table is like seven years old. What we came to realize in our food pantry is that our capacity to store food and purchase food was limited. And when COVID hit, we knew we couldn't keep doing what we had always done. We had to adjust. So we adjusted. We moved to drive through We did that in both Sue's table and in the food pantry. We had a problem with storage, so we moved all the food to the Great Hall. The problem is we couldn't use the Great Hall then. And each step, when we realized we didn't know, we sat back and we started asking questions. What do we know? What do we not know? What are the options here? What can we learn? We prayed. We talked to people that knew more than we did. 
and eventually we moved to the Wesley Building. We eventually hired someone that manages the food pantry and has begun managing Sue's table. This person ha uniquely has extensive experience in the hospitality industry and that has been a huge asset because there were things we did not know that he knows and it gave us a foot forward. Each step we evaluated what is the wise use of our resources. What do we need to learn by our knowledge, our experience, and our discernment? Sue's table's gone through the same thing. We grow, we learn, we change. But not if we are willing or if we are unwilling to get unstuck from the way we've always done things. We're about to make another adjustment in Sue's table. And as we discover that the volume of food exceeds the capacity of some of our teams. And so we're in the middle and we are in the middle of trying to reimagine and manage that, especially um, listening to the voice of someone who has experience in hospitality. Learning new ways to do things. We're learning that in our children's ministry. We're exploring that in youth ministry. We're going to be exploring that with young adult ministry. Our society, actually our entire world, two years ago, got thrown into a place that we haven't experienced in over 200 in over a hundred years and we weren't sure how to manage it at our best wisdom taught us to sit down and ask questions and so when we took the knowledge and the experience, when we prayed, when we discerned, when we adjusted accordingly, we got our best outcomes. Our worst outcomes nationwide or worldwide came when we just simply tried to get people to stop complaining and did what we needed to do to make them happy. The difference between what we should have done and did and what we could have done and did has resulted in a much higher death rate. And it came from the difference between asking directions and just doing and going ahead we're with where we wanted to go. And that's what wisdom does. Wisdom asks us to look the, at the impulses of our desires versus what the choices are better made. Let me give you a story that illustrates that from from a wisdom saying. Once upon a time there was a wise woman and she was walking through and traveling through the mountains and she came to a stream and she looked down and there in the stream was a large precious stone. She picked it up and she put it in her bag. The next day she had stopped for a bite to eat when she encountered a man who was hungry. So she opened her bag to pull food out to give him and instead he saw the stone and impulsively he asked her, would you give me that stone? 
and she reached in, she pulled it out, and she handed it to him without saying a word. A few days later, she encounters the same man on the trail. And this time, as he approaches her, he pulls out that stone that he still had from his pocket. You know, if he had sold the stone, he knew he would be set for life. If he sold the stone, he would never be hungry again. If he sold the stone, he could have immediate gratification. Instead, he gave the stone back to her. And he says, I'm giving this stone back to you in hopes that you will give me something more precious. I want you to give me whatever it is within you that immediately handed over that stone without question. He realized that while the stone might be valuable, even more valuable is that ability to be generous and compassionate. Wisdom is what we, as an older generation, passes down to the younger generation. But if we are truly wise, we will pass that down and then we'll remain to listen to the critique of those that are younger. You see, sometimes younger generations see injustice differently. And they can help us to learn. We are all entrusted with God's wisdom. And for the next four weeks, we're going to look at the four pillars of that wisdom. The first pillar we call the pillar of the bended knee, our humility, our fear of the Lord. Because the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. The next week we will be talking about a listening heart. What the pillar of compassion teaches us. The next week is the cool spirit of being relaxed and being assured and not acting on anxiety or impulse. And then the last one, as we approach Holy Week, will be looking at the pillar of the subversive voice, the pillar that is found in the teachings of Jesus. As we look at each of these, we need to know that wisdom stands on all four together, equally. They must stand together. Because only as we use these pillars and only as we listen to the message of the sage are we willing to really ask the directions we need to go in our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You comfort us in sorrow and bind up our wounds. In sickness you nurse us, and with pure milk you feed us. 
Jesus, by your dying, we are born to new life. By your anguish and labor, we come forth in joy. Despair turns to hope through your sweet goodness. Through your gentleness, we find comfort in fear. Your warmth gives life to the dead. Your touch makes sinners righteous. Lord Jesus, in your mercy, heal us. In your love and tenderness, remake us. In your compassion, bring grace and forgiveness. For the beauty of heaven, may your love prepare us. Heal your warring children. Give strength to the righteous, protect the innocent. Expose the corrupt, help us all work for your justice. Teach us to know the difference. O oh God, make your people whole. We pray this in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand and join as we sing the hymn number 130, God Will Take Care of You.